The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Karen Wen, and this morning we're going to be looking at rock cut architecture, um, which I'm framing as the temple in the cave. Um, the first part is dealing with sort of the Western Silk Road, which I'm calling the ancient and medieval rock cut architecture along the Western Silk Road. When we think of humankind's early relationship to interior spaces, we tend to think of the cave. Um, and the image that comes to mind is usually sort of a primordial, naturally occurring type of appropriated domestic architecture, like this one, um, the Lascaux Cave in the Dordogne in France. Um, this particular cave dates to 17,000 BC, and it speaks a lot to what we know about prehistory. Um, these caves are important to anthropologists and historians in no small part because of um, the phenomenal cave paintings like these that serve as a visual record of prehistoric culture, cultures that we know little about. Um, Buddhist rock cut architecture, um, mostly sacred architecture, which dates from approximately 300 BCE to the 9th century in the Common Era, um, is found in India as well as along much of the Silk Road. Um, these structures are often called cave temples. The term is useful in some ways, but slightly misleading, since it implies that these structures are somehow related to the prehistoric uses of naturally occurring caves like those in the Dordogne, rather than the complex man-made architecture, which is what they actually are, as is evident in this image of the Kailash Temple, which is a Hindu temple at the Ellora Complex in Maharashtra, which dates to the 8th century. And this is an example of um, vertically excavated architecture built over the course of about 125 years and requiring the removal of 200,000 tons of stone. Um, this is quite far from the trope of the unadorned natural cave, which stands outside of history and outside of an urban context, but it's an important concept to keep in mind um, because this trope of the natural cave actually fueled a lot of the building of sacred rock cut architecture, um, especially monastic architecture, which apparently um, evolved out of the practice of Buddhist monks taking um, shelter during the rainy season in naturally occurring caves. And then it followed that um, those spaces were deemed so appropriate for meditation and study, um, especially since they seem to be sort of outside of time, outside of history, and outside of um, the politics and commerce of the day, that it's the, the trope of the cave that keeps recurring even in these um, examples of really um, complex man-made architecture. So this morning, we are going to um, look at global rock cut architecture. That is architecture that is excavated from one large mass of rock. Um, this architecture is illuminating as a global phenomenon in terms of the temporality and geopolitical factors. It's a record of ancient and medieval architecture in many parts of the world that being car carved out of rock survives relatively intact in a way that contemporaneous structures made out of wood cannot. Its durability also means that in many cases, the structures have evolved both stylistically and pro programmatically over the centuries and are an interesting record of our successive, of successive political regimes, religious beliefs, and international connections. Our exploration of this type of architecture will span, span large swaths of geography, locating the phenomenon of rock cut architecture as an undertaking that is not limited to one particular environment or geology, although it's uniformly a byproduct of times characterized by general prosperity, healthy trade relations, and religious devotion. These types of buildings are also evidence of the translation and adaptation of imagery and building types with architectural forms following the spread of beliefs from one geographic area to another. We'll be exploring this specifically in the second part of the lecture where we look more closely at Buddhist monastic architecture in China based on earlier examples from India. But first to give a broad background. Um, we're, we're going to use these structures to help us locate the notion of the global in a temporally and geographically expansive context. The ancient and medieval worlds in which these structures were built were quite interconnected through overland and sea trade routes. For example, as early as 2500 BCE, the Harappan civilization in the Indus Valley had trade relations with Sumer, and through them could reach the markets of Mesopotamia and Egypt. Directly or indirectly, goods from the Indus Valley civilizations also reached Anatolia, 
treat and greets. Um, some of the earliest examples of rock-cut architecture that we have in existence today are from these regions near the Mediterranean Sea, the Black Sea, and the Caspian Sea. Our first site is Beni Hassan in Egypt. Dating to about 2000 BCE, this site, the tombs of Keti and Baket at Beni Hassan in central Egypt, was built during the Middle Kingdom. As in much early rock-cut architecture, these were funerary structures. The site is composed of approximately 39 tombs in total. These are carved from limestone, which is a sedimentary, sedimentary rock composed of largely of calcium carbonate, which is fairly easily eroded by acidic groundwater. And it's the relative softness of the rock that might account for its selection as a site during this very early time period during the Bronze Age. Um, this, the, the images that I'm showing you are the facades that are very simple, excavated horizontally into the hillside. Um, the facades basically are composed of a few simple columns, and if you look at the plan, the, um, the structure is very simple. It's a basically a square chamber um, supported by four columns, um, or with four columns that actually don't provide a support function, but um, divide the space. Our next site is Abu Simbel. Um, which is in Egypt, this time in Lower Egypt or Upper Nubia, um, which is near the present-day Sudanese border. These sandstone structures date to the Iron Age during the reign of the pharaoh Ramses II, um, who ruled from, the, from 1279 to 1213 BCE. It's one of five rock-carved temples that he had built in Nubia. In this case, the rock-cut structures were overlaid atop existing carved cave temples that had been consecrated to local Nubian divinities um, in a display of Egyptian imperial power as the preeminent power in northeastern Africa at the time. The sheer vertical face was cut into the original sloping mountain in order to install a facade of four colossal, colossal statues of a seated Ramses II. Um, so essentially, this um, top image shows the original line of the hill and then the part that was excavated to create the sheer face to make it a more um, monumental structure under Ramses. Um, my, moving across the Mediterranean, my next examples of rock-cut architecture are the Lycaean tombs in Dalian, which is southern Anatolia in present-day Turkey. Lycaea had been in contact with Egypt during the time of Ramses II as part of the Hittite Empire. Subsequently, Lycaea was an independent state and then became a part of the Persian Empire in the 6th century BCE, part of the Greek Empire in the 5th century BCE, and then again part of the Persian Empire in the 4th century BCE until it was conquered by Alexander the Great of Macedon later in the 4th century BCE. These tombs carved into the soft limestone cliffs above the town of Dalian um, around the 4th century BCE reflect both of these influences, the Persian influence, which can be most readily seen in the iconographic and decorative program um, carved in the sculptural reliefs, and the Greek architectural influences of the columns, pilasters, and pediments. Unlike the Egyptian examples, these rock-cut tombs were actually quite close to the urban center of Dalian. Um, around the same time, the, rac the rock-hewn town of Uplistisi in eastern Georgia was being carved with similar influences from Anatolia and Persia. Located between the Caspian and Black Seas, this was another important site of trade along the Silk Road um, since ancient times. It had been a functioning town from the late Bronze Age around the 10th century BCE, and more extensive architectural carving can be dated to the 5th centuries. With continuous pal palimpsestic rebirth during times of more prosperity, especially the flour flourishing trade during the 2nd century BCE all the way through the 2nd century of the Common Era. Um, after the introduction of Christianity in the 4th century, um, they continued to build on top of the existing structures. In the top image, you can see on the right a, a later date um, church from the Byzantine era. Um, and so this is a great example of rock-cut architecture that grew out of the tradition of using naturally occurring caves for shelter um, and was then adapted to a more complex building system. Um, similar to the model in Dalian, this incorporates funerary and sacred architecture with the urban center. Um, so this was actually an entire town which had rock-carved rock um, buildings that served residential, commercial, and sacred pur purposes. Um, from here, let's take a look at the rock-cut architecture found in Persia. The tomb of Darius I 
um, who lived from, the, from 550 to 486 BCE, is located just outside of the ancient capital of Persepolis. The monumental tomb is characterized by the typical Persian complex narrative sculpture reliefs that have been applied to the facade rather than remaining on the interior. And the image on the right is a close-up of, of the sculptural reliefs that are actually on, on the facade of the building. Before we move on to the rock-cut architecture in India and China that will occupy the rest of this lecture, I wanted to show you some late examples of rock-cut architecture in the Christian world in Cappadocia in central Anatolia during the Byzantine Empire. This monastery, Salim Kaleji, was built around the late 10th or early 11th century um, and is one of many examples of monastic and sacred architecture built from the 9th to 12th centuries in this parts of Turkey. These structures were carved out of naturally occurring limestone cones, the shape of which derived from acidic erosion over time. And I also wanted to show these just because it, it is fairly unique. We've, we'll see a lot of the um, horizontally excavated rock architecture. And as in the Allura example, there's some vertically excavated rock architecture. And then this is a very influ interesting confluence between the, national, the naturally occurring sort of cone forms and um, the cave temples and monasteries that are carved in them um, so as not to appear to be man-made architecture. So if you look at the map on which I've annotated the locations of the rock cut architectural sites um, and compare it with a map showing the many trade routes which were associated with the Silk Road, and for our purposes I'll just define that as the broad network of trade routes used by traders across Eurasia from basically starting in China at the eastern point of Luoyang um, all the way to the eastern Mediterranean shore spanning the huge swath of time from the first millennium BCE or possibly earlier, possibly the second millennium BCE, to the middle of the sec second millennium of the Common Era. You'll see the location of these sites more or less conforms to the trade routes. <laughs> In the next section, we'll examine the religious migration of Buddhism and Buddhist sacred architecture along these same trade networks from its origins in India eastward to China north or eastward to China via Central Asia, looking specifically at the model of monastic architecture found in Ajanta in Western India. So the rock cut Buddhist monastery complex at Ajanta is located in the present day state of Maharashtra in Western India, which is about 60 miles north of the present day city of Aurangabad. This serene, secluded, natural setting was an appropriate location for the cultivation of an ascetic lifestyle. In total, there were 30 caves that are carved out along the steep sides of the horseshoe-shaped basalt cliffs surrounding the Wagahora River ravine, with the seasonal waterfall spilling down to the river below, um, which you can kind of see the, the ghost of that waterfall on the left in this image. Um, the caves are accessible by a single path that curves around the cliffs for about a half a kilometer, which stands about 80 meters above the riverbed. There are thousands of excavated cave temples in India alone, um, especially those in eastern and southern India that predate Ajanta, but I'll focus our discussion on Ajanta as an important example of rock-cut Buddhist sacred architecture because of the long time span that this one um, monastic center covers. The excavations took place um, over six or seven centuries, beginning in the early second century BCE, possibly third century BCE, extending all the way to the seventh century CE um, in two distinct phases. Um, the early period of excavation at Ajanta occurred from around 200 BCE to 100 BCE, um, where uh, which was about three to four centuries after the life of the historical Buddha um, when Buddhism had already become a monastic religion. This was a period of Hinayana Buddhism, um, which is visually manifested in relatively stark architectural typologies without images of the Buddha. The second phase took place from the middle of the 5th century CE into the 7th century during a period of Mahayana Buddhism, which represents where, where representations of the Buddha were integral parts of the architectural program and relief. And um, just to give you a little sense of the geology of the area, 
Um, essentially, this site was, was picked, um, you know, both because it's quite beautiful and was considered an appropriate site for this type of monastic complex, um, but also because the rock formations made it especially um, easy to, to excavate caves horizontally um, without doing a lot of preliminary work. As we saw in the Abu Simbel um, example in Egypt, um, there was a lot of preliminary work to create a vertical face, but in this case, the vertical face was already in existence. Um, essentially, these basalt cliffs formed um, from lava, which um, settled in horizontal lava flows. So it was already sort of forming these, these natural horizontal um, ranges, um, which basically when the lava cools, the heavier particles settle first, which causes a slightly coarser stone at the bottom of each, um, of each range of rock. So basically, the upper portion of any of these temples can be carved um, to a much finer degree, and the lower portion of these, um, of these rock ranges can be carved in a much coarser manner, um, which is evident when you actually look at the surviving sculpture there as well. Um, essentially, it's a very simple technique. You select a rock face and then hack out the, the rock starting from top to bottom and front to back, back um, using um, and then finish it with chiseling techniques. Um, the people who were doing this type of work were originally probably carpenters, and then as the centuries wore on, it developed into an independent trade of stone carving. And um, it's um, very probable that a lot of the uh, workmanship that we see at Ajanta you know, was created by some of the same workmen who were creating the other monastic Buddhist complexes um, in other parts of India. So the first phase of excavation, just to get back to the specific history of Ajanta, is, um, began during the decline of the Mauryan Empire, which ran from 322 BCE to 185 BCE, when the Satavahana dynasty was on the rise in southern and central India. Um, the Satavahana had been a feudatory entity of the Mauryan Empire that adopted Buddhism due to the influence of the Emperor Ashoka, then declared their independence from the larger empire after Ashoka's death in 232 BCE. Their independence from the larger empire, oh, their, their patronage of Buddhism resulted in many monuments, including other rock-cut monastic complexes and other forms in the positive, like the great stupa at Sanchi. The second major period of excavation commenced about four centuries later, as we said earlier, under the patronage of Harisena of the Vakataka dynasty, which ran from the mid third to the late fifth century of the common era. Um, he ascended to power personally in 460 in the, in the mid-5th uh, century, and a lot of the work at Ajanta is really from the late 5th century. Um, Harisena um, encouraged wealthy officials from the immediate and adjacent regions to initiate a new age of building at Ajanta, changing the mode of donation from the earlier Hinayana model, um, where donations were pooled for the creation of the complex as a whole, and he changed it to a model where there was a single sponsor per cave. So there was a little bit more um, individual investment in the type of construction and carving going on in each of these caves. Um, the most architectural and artistic activity of the period, like I said, seems to have taken place in the last half of the fifth century to the first half of the sixth century um, with the building of the most sumptuous caves with some of the most ornate sculpture and painting, including caves 17 and 26, which we will look at shortly. I just wanted to mention the numbering system, which you can see on this plan of Ajanta here. Um, the caves are referred to by number, and it's um, simply been assigned um, in maybe the late 19th or early 20th century um, in the order that you approach each cave. So it has nothing to do with the, um, with the time period or the order in which the caves were built. It's a simple um, numerical system. Um, so just to complete our timeline of Ajanta, we should note that paralleling the decline of Buddhism in India during the later Gupta period, the monastic complex at Ajanta was gradually diminished and then abandoned over the next centuries. Um, but luckily, due to the natural properties of this very sheltered river ravine, um, the, the, cave was remarkably, the caves were remarkably well preserved for about a thousand years um, until it was sort of rediscovered by British troops in the 19th century. Um, the complex is very rich in terms of architectural history, as well as offering some of the most well-preserved examples of mural painting and sculpture from this time period, 
that are still in existence. And this is part of why I think that um, rock cut architecture is so important is that you know it really is this marriage of um, sculpture, painting, and architecture, and that the form is um, really defined by all three simultaneously, which is part of why Ajanta is so important because we still do have the painting that sort of rounds out um, how these phases were used. Um, and we'll get to a little bit more of that later. So to show you a little bit more about individual caves, um, the architecture of Ajanta can be divided into two main categories, the Chaitya and the Vihara. And in this um, view of some of the caves in succession, you can see the the fronts of caves that have the sort of porches with um, very thick pillars, those are the viharas, which are the monks' dwellings. And um, towards the um, extreme left of this image, you can see the um, larger horseshoe-shaped windows, um, which signify the shaitiyas or the assembly halls or prayer halls, um, which um, had slightly higher ceilings and let a lot more light in through that horseshoe-shaped window. Um, this is an example of a Chaitya, um, which is Cave 10. It's one of the earliest excavations at Ajanta from approximately 200 BCE. Um, and it reflects very well the simplicity of the early temple design um, with an absence of Buddha imagery. The interior consists of a high vaulted ceiling with ribs that reflect the imitation of timber construction. And it should be noted that this area, um, because of you know, heavy rainfall, did have an abundance of timber and there was um, a lot of wooden and timber construction um, that obviously does not survive to this day. So um, Ajanta is especially interesting in seeing how the stone forms were used to sort of mimic the, the more traditional wooden forms that would have been um, in daily use at the time. Um, the interior space is divided by colonnades into a central nave apse and side aisles. The central apse houses the stupa, which is also a completely excavated structure. So that's part of the, um, the cliff side that the rest of the cave is carved out of as well. The exterior, which you can see on the left, is marked by a large arched window. And that's the key to understanding how the excavation for these large halls um, took place. Um, essentially, um, as I said before, the process is from top to bottom and from front to back. So a suitable vertical face was chosen for thickness and texture, um, part of the texture relating to those very um, primordial um, lava flows and the way that they cooled millions of years ago. Um, the, sec the sanctuary um, is basically um, carved, um, w since it's carved from front to back and from top down, it eliminates any need for scaffolding. And the process could be halted at any time and restarted um, quite easily. Uh, if you look at the extreme right bottom corner, um, cave one is our next destination. Um, this is a vihara, and it's one of the later caves at Ajanta, dating from the, probably the late fifth century. Um, the porch front, which you can see a little bit better in this image, um, was actually one of the more ornate um, porches on these vihara complexes, which you can see with the very ornate um, carving at the top. The plan on the inside is still relatively simple. Uh, it has 20 columns um, that sort of mimic the square sides of the room. And there are 14 um, cells or monks rooms, which are actually quite small, um, that skirt the, the side of the vihara. Um, at the back, you see an, a small antechamber that leads into a small sanctuary with an image of the Buddha, which is um, um, indicating that this is from the later period of Mahayana Buddhism and showing how basically the, um, the form of the Vihara had changed from being essentially just um, a place for study and rest to being a place for worship as well in this later Mahayana period. The interior of Cave 1, which um, the, the painting is actually quite well preserved, and as a result, there's very little photography that's allowed in order to keep it preserved. But as you can see, um, the columns are actually quite ornate, um, despite the very simple floor plan. And they would have all been painted. The walls were all painted, and the ceiling was also painted. Um, so even in, in the um, monastic setting of the Vihara, 
there was an element of worship that actually went on with regards to the imagery in the paintings that were on the um, walls, on the pillars, and on the ceiling. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. This is one of the more famous intact paintings that's inside the Ajanta Cave One, um, which is the Bodhisattva of the Lotus. Um, when you look in comparison at these two Chaitya halls, Cave 10 and Cave 26, um, which are from the Hinayana and Mahayana periods respectively, um, you can see how basically the um, stupa has transformed from being a very simple um, cylindrical, uh, cylindrical domed um, architectural feature to something that actually has a um, image of the Buddha in sculptural relief as part of the structure. So um, originally the um, stupa itself was um, basically derived from burial mounds. Um, the, the simple process of circumambulation became um, stupa veneration and by the third century there was really um, a lot of um, interest in the laity of having um, more Buddha imagery. Um, the, the way this was sort of reconciled was um, sculptural relief as in cave 26 would have been embedded into the stupa itself so the object could be venerated from the front when um, the monks were assembled in prayer hall or um, it could also just be incorporated into part of the circumambulation which the stupa would have still been used for in the second, in the, in the second phase of Mahayana Buddhism. So, a little bit more about the situation of Ajanta. Um, like most monastic settlements, Ajanta is located somewhat out of the way of major urban centers, but reasonably close to trade routes. In this case, the main overland trade routes um, connecting the north, connecting northern India, which was a site of extreme um, commerce and commercial activity, um, with the western coast and the Deccan Plateau. And it's not actually labeled on this um, map, since this is a map of trade routes, but it would essentially be here between the um, Paitan, which is represented here as Pratistana, and Ujjain. So it would be right here close enough to trade routes, um, but not actually on them so as to remain somewhat removed from that part of life. Um, so being reasonably close to trade, through, trade routes, um, Ajanta was well visited by pilgrims from throughout Asia, including the 17th or the seventh century Chinese monk Xuanzang, um, who was one of many travelers along the Silk Road, but one who we we're able to actually track his progress and, and, and read his works um, about his observations when he was visiting monastic complexes in India. Um, he was able to travel thousands of miles relying only on the vast network of Buddhist monasteries and rest houses for hospitality and shelter. Depicted here as he often is in the clothes of a traveler laden with a pack filled with scrolls. Um, on the back you can kind of see the indications of many um, sort of circular forms. That's supposed to be the end of the scrolls which he brought back which was um, more than 600 in total. Um, Xuanzang traveled from Tang Dynasty China to India in order to visit and study the Buddhist Holy Land with the goal of bringing more accurate translations of Buddhist sutras and scriptures back with him to China. Before making his pilgrimage to India in 629, Xuanzang has already traveled extensively among the Buddhist monastic complexes in China. So I believe he began in northeastern China, um, but he actually spent quite a lot of time in southwestern China in Sichuan and also near the capital in Chang'an. Um, so throughout his 17-year journey with um, uh, sorry, um, Xuanzang had already traveled extensively among the Buddhist monastic complexes in China. His 17-year journey to India and back brought him west through the Taklamakan Desert, then through Central Asia before he could head south to India. Um, once in India, he traveled through the Gangetic Plain in North India, um, which we saw was very um, well healed with um, trade routes. Um, and and in these places, he found many bustling monastic centers populated by thousands of monks. But he also found others that were fairly deserted, indicating that Buddhism was on the wane in India. 
Um, he spent many years studying in eastern India, then traveled um, through the south and west, which is when he stopped at Ajanta, before returning to China, again through Central Asia, but this time skirting the southern side of the Taklamakan Desert. And um, this map actually sort of simplifies it, but his, his um, route home would have sort of taken him this way, but then also to Dunhuang. So since we've already started to look at the evolution of Chaitya forms um, within the Ajanta complex itself, let's um, follow in Xuanzang's footsteps from India back to China, comparing, as he no doubt must have, the iconic and architectural transformations visible in Buddhist monastic architecture outside of China, outside of India, that looked to Indian prototypes, but evolved and changed in its new cultural con context. Um, so this shows the, the trade routes sort of more simply um, in terms of how these, um, how the Gangetic Plain would have been traversed with Ajanta as, as an important mid, midpoint. So the Kitsil Caves, which were in the Kingdom of Kucha, which is now in Xinjiang province in China, are an interesting um, point of departure from the from the stupa model in the Chaityas in Ajanta. And it should be noted that um, the monastic complex at Ajanta um, represents a, a much earlier um, phase of monastic development where there were maybe four Chaityas or assembly halls and the rest 26 um, viharas or monks' dwellings. So when we start to move east into China, um, it's quite the opposite and there are um, many more Chaitya assembly halls than viharas. Um, if we look at the um, plan of the Cave 38 at Kitsil, which dates from the 4th to 5th century, so roughly contemporaneous with the later structures at Ajanta, we see that rather than having a stupa in the um, back apse of the Chaitya Hall, it's actually been transformed into um, what they've sort of um, <laughs> clumsily started to call the central pillar stupa, um, which is located in roughly the same place that the stupa would be in the Chaitya Hall in Ajanta. Um, so the question presents itself as to whether this represents a very significant evolution, and if so, is that coming from, from Central Asia or China, or is it just a natural evolution coming out of India? If you look at the image on the left, you can see sort of the front of the um, central pillar stupa, which would have had a devotional image in that um, niche for a sculptural image. The um, back part, which is part of the circumambulation, which you can see on the plan, is actually divided again into two chambers. And then the, the exit, which you see on the right, is um, graced with another image of the Buddha. So you know we see that the Kitsil cage, which were constructed already in the Mahana period, have you know, a, um, a large amount of the painting and the sculptural imagery as well. The um, circumambulatory passage, um, which is part of the ritual devotion, is um, not just defined by the architecture, but also by the paintings. And in this image of the section of the plan, you can see how even though they haven't been able to actually transpose the images, they've been able to sort of see the striations um, of the types of imagery that you see on the walls. And there is a vertical progression. At the bottom most level, you'll see the um, um, images of the life of the Buddha. Um, and then as you as you go up, you see um, Jataka tales, which are, in theory, um, images of the events of the life of the Buddha before he became the historical Buddha. So um, essentially, they're, they're tales that um, might have had folk origins but have been incorporated into the Buddhist pantheon. Um, but even this little switch from the stories of the life of the Buddha to the Jataka tales is um, sort of going from the very concrete historical narrative to a slightly more abstract mythical narrative. If you look at um, the Ajanta Cave 17, which is also a later period um, Bihara cave, um, there were painted pillars that were actually used in the Vihara um, for circumambulation. 
So you see sort of a confluence of the use of the pillar rather than the actual domed stupa form um, going on at the same time with the imagery and the stories um, sort of being the common link. If you move for, further east to Dunhuang, which was you know, one of the great caravanserais, um, which was a meeting of all different types of Buddhism, um, you see in Cave 254, which also dates from around the fifth century, that the um, stupa has turned into not just a, um, a central stupa pillar, but it is actually slightly more central to the plan. If you look at the um, Kitsil model, the, the, stupa, the central stupa pillar is actually still quite towards the rear um, where the apse would have been in the Ajanta model. Um, but in Dunhuang, it, the, the square form of the Chaitya Hall actually takes precedence and, um, and it becomes much more of a central model. So we see the pillar sort of coming away from, from the stupa model um, and taking on a life of its own. If you look in Yungang, China, which is um, about as far east as the um, Silk Road is considered to go, we see another type of sculpted central pillar. Um, this one looking very much more distinctly like a Chinese pagoda with the um, very distinct levels and the um, vertical coursing that indicates the sort of um, roof-like um, architecture. So I would like to argue that the pillar in Dunhuang is actually receiving this um, type of architectural typology from both the Chinese model, which um, is a much more elongated pagoda form, and the Kitzel model, which is um, basically translating the stupa into this pillar form. Um, the commonality that we see um, between the Chinese model and the Indian model is essentially looking at the um, central pillar as the axis mundi, which is something that is um, common to Buddhist ideology, where the um, central axis of a stupa is considered the pillar that connects heaven with earth. Um, in the Dunhuang model, we see the um, wall paintings striated in even a more direct way than in the Kitsil model, where the striations actually um, go from the life of the Buddha at the bottom to, um, to the heavens um, at the top. So um, the, the confluence of this idea in Confucianism and Taoism, as well as Buddhism, is basically how this form of the central pillar stupa has um, translated from the Indian model to the Chinese model. So um, just to sum up, um, I've tried to take uh, rock cut architecture from a very um, global perspective, both looking at the, um, the rock cut architecture that's taking place around the Mediterranean, the Persian Gulf, the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, um, and as it moved from its original sources in India through Central Asia um, into China. Um, interestingly enough, it's um, still the trope of the cave that we started with that seems to be the um, most enduring um, element that is written about um, in terms of how these um, caves were used um, by Buddhist monks and how the monastic complexes continued to thrive even when they were extremely busy um, sort of scholarly centers. They were um, often referred to as being very grounded by the physical place that they were in and by um, the sort of um, cool calm of these interior cave spaces. Thank you.